It is good to gather together. And I love that, uh, Andrew, that uh, around the world, there are communities that are gathering together, not just for social interaction, but we gather together around Jesus, the risen Jesus, and around his word. And it's good to hear that we're part of this big movement. There's things going on in this world, and God has a plan, and he is still carrying that out through his church. Well, this last week, there was a huge uh, event. Um, I don't know if, well, we didn't see it really here in Saskatoon, but there was this solar eclipse that happened. Um, And uh, if you were in the right spot, you could see this, uh, the, the, the moon was in front of the sun. You're not supposed to look at it. That light is still powerful enough to do good damage. Good damage? Uh... To do damage to your eyes, but it was amazing to see this uh, this picture and the effect that this has on the earth. I uh, came across this one, this shadow that that it causes on the earth. And as I was uh, preparing this week, I thought this was a good metaphor for where we're at in First Samuel. That this is uh, there's a light in dark times. Um, And and to explain that further, in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the Lord. Where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, or the King James Version has it, the people perish. And the idea that sometimes you hear this verse is around leadership circles or congregational meetings that we are looking for a big picture. Tell us about where we're going. What's the plan for five years from now? And how are we going to get there? And I love that big picture thinking. I, uh, I, I love to, to dream and to think about where God is moving. And it's an exciting time for us here at West Portal. And I'm excited about what God wants to do in us and through us over the next five years. But that's not what this verse is about. This verse is about the word of the Lord going out. And, and the ESV helps us zero in on that by using that word prophetic. Uh, the, the, where there is no prophetic vision, where the word of God is not going out, the people cast off restraint. A- and the idea is that, that God's word is good and it gives light, but where there, it's not being spoken, where people don't know God, where they don't know his way, they are left in darkness. And that's what we see in Judges. Uh, the, the book of Judges, just before Samuel, ends with that refrain, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They were living in darkness. They, they cast off all restraint, and it was a terrible time. The priests acted selfishly. Men behaved badly. Um, the... The warlords, these judges, ruled by might, and justice was miscarried. I mean, their idea of justice was that a a, a whole city was slaughtered for the death of one person. It was darkness in those times, and God's uh, solution to this darkness is to send a prophet. Not since Moses had there been a national prophet But now God is going to send a prophet who will speak the word of the Lord. Who will bring that prophetic vision to the people. So that they might not walk in darkness, but walk in light. So this morning as we we look at our passage, we'll see this darkness and this light. And what God wants to do in Samuel's time and what God wants to do in our time Through his word. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up. We are in uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 12, and it begins with this darkness, this uh, contrast between the sons of Eli and the sons of, uh, or the son of Hannah. 
And verse 12, the darkness in the priesthood. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Well, e Eli was the priest, and so his, his sons de facto became priests. But they were worthless men. Another version has it, they were scoundrels. Literally, they're the sons of Belial, which is another name for, for Satan. They were terrible men, and, and you see this, they did not know the Lord. And you don't have to be a biblical scholar to know that there's a problem going on when those priests who are there to, to show the way of the Lord don't know the Lord themselves. Uh, that when uh, those, uh, those pastors who are to preach the good news of Jesus don't know Jesus themselves, there's a problem. There's a problem. When, when those who are, are commissioned to, to share the light are living in darkness. How great is that darkness? And so there is this darkness. These, these sons, um, they are worthless men. And, and we see their behavior. Their behavior flows from their beliefs. It always does. If you want to see what somebody truly believes, just look at the way that they act. And we see three things in these guys' lives. Number one, they steal. They steal from the people. Verse 13, the custom of the priests with the people, the custom, this is what they regularly did. It wasn't a one-off, but their custom was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Now, uh, they are in Shiloh. This is a city about 30 kilometers north of Jerusalem, and that's where the tabernacle is. This was the dwelling place of God that uh, Moses gave instructions for, went with the people of Israel, and Joshua set it up there in Shiloh. Shiloh was the national uh, worship center, and so people from all over Israel would come there to meet with Yahweh and to offer their sacrifices. And when they did, they had to give a portion to the priests. In Leviticus, it says that the priest gets the, the right shoulder and the right thigh. But these, and the rest was for the worshiper to have, to have like a, a potluck together, to enjoy this big barbecue together as a big family. But what the priests were doing is they weren't satisfied with this amount. And so as the, the meat was cooking, they would walk around and... They could smell it, and they'd have their three-pronged uh, three fork, and yikes, I'll have some of that. And, well, that looks good, and it was a little smorgasbord going on there. And they were stealing from the people. They weren't content, but even more, they were stealing from God. And verse 15 says, Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. They were taking the fat. Now Leviticus again says the fat is God's portion, the best of it. You know, the marble, that's the Lord's. And these priests wanted it for themselves. They were stealing from the people and they were stealing from the Lord. And then secondly, they were bullying the worshipers. Uh, verse 16. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it to me now. And if not, I will take it by force. So... So what would happen is these worshipers were offering this and they were more righteous than the priests. And they would say, no, 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 let the fat go, that's, that's for the Lord. But then you can take as much as you want from me. And the priest would say, no, we want the best. We want the best to eat. And if you don't give it to us, we're going to give you something to eat. Good old knuckle sandwich. 
These guys were, were despicable, and thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. They steal, they bully, and they abuse their power. Uh, verse 22, if you skip down. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel. Their ongoing practice. And how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. These fellows abused their power. And they took advantage of the women who were serving there. To get what they wanted. And it wasn't good. And Eli, well he didn't do anything about it until he's very old. And then he gives this half-hearted Rebuke, Verse 23, and he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Eli gives this rebuke, but really it's too little, too late. And he doesn't stop them. He doesn't remove them from office. Uh, and these guys continue on. And the Lord will deal with the darkness. But there is this great darkness in the priesthood. But amidst that, there's this light that shines. In the middle of this passage, twice you hear about Samuel. It's a picture of the eclipse. It's dark, but there is light. And the first scene is in, in verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. A boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. And indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Samuel, the boy who was faithful, and Hannah, the mother who was faithful. She continued to support her son. Though she, she didn't see him regularly, she would go once a year and she would bring him this robe. And the robe was the proper priestly garment to wear underneath that ephod. And I get it. I get it. When uh, I was uh, starting off my ministry, uh, the first thing uh, my mom said to me was, James, you can't wear that. <laughs> and so she didn't get me a robe. She bought me some, uh, some clothes, uh, some nicer uh, clothes to wear. And I was talking to my wife this last week, and she said, yeah, James, you used to, uh, you used to dress so nice. What happened? <laughs> Uh, there's the secret. And mom, if you're watching, it's been about a year. <laughs> Hannah supported her, her son in his ministry. A and the Lord blessed Hannah and the Lord blessed Samuel. You see it with Hannah. The Lord gives her these children. And you see this with Samuel, that he grew in the presence of the Lord. This light is present in the midst of the darkness. Then again, it, we see it in verse 26. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow, both in stature and in favor, with the Lord and also with men. And you see the contrast here between Samuel and Phinehas and Hophni. That Eli's sons had a bad report from all the people. But, but Samuel has a good report from all the people. And, and uh, um, Phinehas and Hophni, it's the Lord's will to put them to death. But Samuel has found favor with the Lord. This light in dark times. And the role of parents in this. And parents, we have a role to play. 
a God-given role to bring up our children, to know God, and to walk in his way. And even those that grow up around the church need to come to know Jesus personally, to know the Lord. And parents, uh, so we support our children, and uh, we pray for them, and we even have those hard conversations with them to set those boundaries. You know, when your 14-year-old wants to get TikTok because all her friends have it, or when your 25-year-old, his full-time job is playing Fortnite down in the basement. Parents, dads, uh, your, your, your son doesn't need you to be hip or cool. And moms, your daughter doesn't need you to be another Lorelei Gilmore. Parents, you are a gift to your children to bring them up to know Jesus and to walk in his way. And that job, that is a lifelong job. The parenting doesn't end. You continue to support them. Uh, when, when I was 25 years old, I was, uh, I was a little bit uh, zealous. <laughs> and uh, me and my friends, we decided to start a prayer meeting in our group. We called it Club Pega. We thought a cool name. It comes out of Ezekiel. It means like a watchman, a man who stands on the tower. And we planned it for Tuesday mornings, 5.30 a.m., <laughs> And it wasn't as popular as you might think. <laughs> In fact, we only had five, uh, five regulars that came. Uh, the pastor, he was an early bird and he wanted to support us. Uh, my parents... I think they heard me getting up in the morning. They would drive up at about 529 and my dad's eyes were half shut. And my parents' best friends. <laughs> Because misery loves company. <laughs> but my parents would support me in my ministry. When I was serving out in Germany, they came out and uh, visited me. When I'd be in Indonesia, they, uh, they prayed for me. Uh, they encouraged me. They would uh, give me uh, phone calls. When, when I was running an alpha program, they were there every Friday night to stand with me. See, parents, uh, we are called to walk with our children through their life, to pray for them and support them. And we, the Bible says that children are a gift to parents. And I think the other way is true as well. Parents, you're a gift to your children. And children in this time, young children, older children, here's your warning. Mother's Day is uh, coming up. I think Pastor Andrew gave like a warning about Valentine's Day He's a little bit more of a romantic. <laughs> I'm giving you a warning about Mother's Day because I'm a little bit more of a mama's boy. <laughs> it's coming up. But parents, you have a role to play, a God-given role to play in the life of your children. There was darkness and there was light. And God will, um, as we move on to the next part of this passage, we'll see how God... God removes the darkness, and he establishes, he brings the light. So the next part, uh, the Lord removes darkness. He deals with it. Verse 27. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him? out of all the tribes of Israel, to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. And God starts his rebuke off with uh, Eli by, by saying how the priesthood was a gift. It was a good gift that while they were still in Egypt, God chose Aaron to be a priest. And the office of priest is to be a mediator, a go-between. A, a, a priest represents God to the people and he represents the people to God. And, and so Aaron was a priest and, and 
Eli comes from uh, Ithathar and down through one of Aaron's sons. And so he is established as a, uh, a priest, but he's not content with the offerings. Verse 29, why then did you scorn my sacrifice and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me? By fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. And here we get in a little deeper view of the motivation of, uh, of Eli. That he honors his sons above God. He chooses his family ahead of, uh, ahead of the way of the Lord. And we also see that Eli participated in this stealing by fattening yourselves on the choicest part of every offering. That perhaps one of the reasons that Eli didn't challenge his sons earlier is that he had no moral ground to stand on. He was just as guilty as they. And so the Lord will wipe the slate clean. He'll remove this priesthood. Verse 34, And this shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, what shall come upon them shall be assigned to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And that happens in chapter, chapter 4. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. The priesthood will be removed from Eli. And it's not given to Samuel. He's, he's never called a priest in here. He is a prophet. A prophet is there to, to speak forth. The office of a prophet is not to foretell the future, but to foretell the word of the Lord. But the priest that will replace, if you guys are interested, later on in the time of Solomon, there is a, a Abiathar, which is the descendant of Eli, is taken out of office, and Zadok is put in. And, that's, and he points back to this passage. God's word is true, and he will see it pass. And that's on the near horizon, but on the far horizon, you can see who this is pointing toward. A faithful priest who will do all that is according to my heart, and in my mind, the author in Hebrews, he says that it's Jesus. Since then, verse chapter 4, verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Isn't that great? And we see this high priest doing his, his priestly duties, right? He represents the people to God there on the cross. My burden gladly bearing. He takes our, our sins. And he takes the best sacrifice that he has himself. And he offers it. And the priest represents God to the people. <laughs> and, uh, and the priest, after that day of atonement, you know, the priest would come out from that, uh, from that temple. And his first words to the people... Shalom, peace, God is with us. And you remember in the gospel of John, when, when after Jesus' resurrection and he meets with his disciples in, this, in that locked room, his first words to the disciples, shalom. And this is his first words to us as we come to him, shalom. Peace with God. It is finished. This is the priest that is pointed towards in here. God will deal with this darkness here in part, but then in full. And he will bring his light. He'll bring his light. It's one of my favorite chapters, chapter 3. And here's how it starts off. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. He was serving the Lord, but he was mentoring under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Here's the problem. The word of the Lord was rare. The word vision here is the same one as, as, as Proverbs 29, 18. There was no prophetic vision. There was no restraint. Eli's sons cast off all restraint. The people were walking in darkness. 
And the darkness is symbolized here. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. Eli's eyesight is getting dim. Darkness. Uh, Eli and Samuel are lying down. It's nighttime. There's darkness. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. There's darkness. But there is some light. And God will bring that light through a prophet. Verse 4, Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That our children were that eager when we called their voice. <laughs> He runs to Eli. But you see this, he didn't know the Lord. That's the same thing that's said about Phinehas and Hophni. They did not yet know the Lord. In, in, C, in, Eli's, uh, in, in Samuel's uh, internship, Eli passed over this important lesson. Here's the word of the Lord. Here's how you know his voice. But the Lord isn't dissuaded from that. He will, he will act. And the Lord called to Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. His sight is dim, but he's not quite blind. And he gives him wise word. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. And a new day dawns for the nation. Speak, for your servant hears. And this word hear is not just to listen, it's to obey and Samuel gets a hard message. His first message, it's a real baptism by fire. He's given the, the, pro, the, the message that Eli, judgment is coming on Eli. And Samuel is faithful with those hard words. And church, we want to be faithful with the whole counsel of God. The good parts and the hard parts. Because we believe that the word of, of the Lord brings life. That it blesses, it corrects, and it calls us to his way. And we see that here. We see that in, in the uh, symbolism here. When, when, when Samuel wakes up, it's morning. It's a new day. And his first thing that he does is he opens up the temple doors. The word of the Lord is going to go forth here. And we see how God blesses it. Verse 19, and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. The Lord was with him. This is God's faithful presence standing with him. And he would not let his words fall to the ground. That Samuel spoke the word of Lord and the, and the word of the Lord. And the Lord accomplished his purposes through his word. They didn't fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. A prophet had come, not since Moses. Now there's a prophet, one who will speak forth the word of the Lord. And he's recognized throughout the promised land. From Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. Again and again and again, 
the, remember the problem. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. But now the Lord's appearing again and again and again in Shiloh. How? For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel through his word, by the word of the Lord. Yeah, there was special revelation. And yes, there were these scrolls, these books of that first prophet of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, that told of who their God was. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That told the people who they are, you are my chosen possession. You are my royal nation. You are a people called out of darkness into light to proclaim the light of him who called you. And they were told how they should walk, what justice looks like. Take care of the widows and the fatherless. Make room for the foreigners and the poor. And the word of the Lord went out from Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. And that's where this passage ends, with the light starting to dawn. And so, church, let me talk two applications. The first, the first is to look at the light. Look at the light. God has given us light so that we might walk in it, that we might not walk in darkness, blinded and stubbing our toes on everything, but that we might see the way and, and the fullness of his light is only seen in Jesus. Jesus made this audacious claim in John chapter 8. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you want to know how to live, if you want to know light, look to Jesus and follow him. Then you will step out of the darkness. See, some people walk by lesser luminaries, by Moses or Elijah, by Confucius or Plato. No, Jesus says, I am the fullness of light. Walk in, walk with me and I will take you out of darkness. And if you don't know if the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to you, if you don't know that, listen, God wants to speak to you. And you can find him here. In the gospel of John, he speaks clearly. If you're interested in knowing him and knowing him more, then, then the gospel of John is a great place to read. 21 chapters and to read a chapter a day. But before you read, to say those wise words of Samuel, speak, Lord. For your servant hears. And I tell you that's a prayer that the Lord loves to answer. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know his heart for you. And his way for you to walk. That's first. Look to the light. And the second, the second is shine his light. <laughs> That's the purpose of, of the moon in relation to the sun, right? It's not to block out the light of the sun, but it, it, it shines the light in those dark times. And that's the purpose of, of God's people, to shine his light in the darkness. Jesus makes that, again, an audacious claim. In Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. You, we, you know, with, with the darkness in the world, sometimes we fall into despair and we fall into cynicism and say, oh, nothing is going to change. This is a horrible place. That's not God's solution for this. God's solution, when, when there's darkness in this world, do you know what his solution is? You, to send you and you and you and me together. That we would shine his light. And that's what we do here. We're a community that, that practices loving God, loving one another, and loving this world. And if you want to know what we're on about, come on out on testimony night and hear how Jesus has met with some people. It's going to be great. 
Uh, and you never grow tired of hearing these stories, how Jesus meets with people and where he is calling them to follow him. And church, this is what we are on about together, about making his light known here in Saskatoon, there in Austria, around the world, that the word of the Lord would continue to go forth and pierce the darkness with his light. The light has come. And though there is darkness, the darkness shall not overcome it. Amen? Amen. Well, worship team, why don't you come on, come on up here and let me pray for us. Well, Father, Father, you have revealed yourself uh, to us through, this, uh, through these testaments. But most fully, we see who you are in your heart in Jesus. He has come to make you known that you are a God who watches and waits for his children to turn and runs out towards them and hugs them and kisses them and puts uh, new robes on them. Who could have ever dreamed up a God like this? Thank you, Father, that you've come to give us light. And we are sorry where we've walked in the darkness. Lord, where we've been like Hophni and Phinehas. Where we've thought about ourselves first. Steal and bully and abused power. Where, where we've been like Eli and we've... Uh, we've, we've favored our children ahead of you, or where we've been cowards. Lord, help us. And thank you, Jesus, that you have paid this price in full, the price for our sins, and now you speak to us, shalom. And you give to us your spirit that this good law is written on our heart and you've empowered us that we might live this as individuals and as communities. And I pray that your spirit would dwell among us richly. Lord, that we would live as your people. That West Portal would be known as a light in this community. This is something that only you can do. So we pray that you would do this. And Lord, we pray that your word would continue to go forth and press against the darkness. That you would bring light to individuals, to couples, to families, to nations. Lord, you're able to bring light. You are able to bring the new day. So do it. Let the doors open up and your word go forth. And we ask this in the name of the prophet and of the priest and of the king. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.